I do firmly believe that once the yen goes, the entire global Keynesian system based on the U.S. dollar will go with it. The land of Arcania. Well, hello there, my friends. Rafi here from The End Game Investor. With this week's Silver Report for Arcadia Economics, and this week passed quietly, both in terms of no bombing, and silver was rather quiet also, but we seem to be closing the week, possibly if we can close today, over $30 back above the silver squeeze highs. And if we can close June above 30, it'd be in pretty good shape. It looks like silver's bounced off the 50-day moving average. Don't know if that will hold, but so far for the month of June, which has been a cool down pullback month, staying above 30 for the month would be what we want to see. What I'd like to talk about today is the yen appears to be breaking down. And as you know, if you've been watching these reports, I believe the yen is a critical component of the global Keynesian system that was set up in the 1970s. Japan has been an outpost of the dollar-based monetary system since its inception as a fiat system. And that is why the Japanese banking system appears to be the first foreign banking system directly affected by the rise in U.S. interest rates because the Japanese are invested to the tune of $1.15 trillion in treasury bonds, which is the most of any country in the world. I do firmly believe that once the yen goes, the entire global Keynesian system based on the U.S. dollar will go with it. And that is why I believe that Norin Chukin Bank, I think I pronounced it correctly, is busy broadcasting to the world that it is going to sell $65 billion worth of bonds by March next year. Even though when you want to make these kinds of moves, you're not supposed to tell anybody unless you're trying to influence and manipulate a certain central bank to give you a better price before you sell. Anyway, there's a lot to get into this week, a lot more than that. We're going to go through the slides, but first, this week's Silver Report is brought to you by Fortuna Mining. Not Fortuna Silver Mines, that does not exist. They changed their name to Fortuna Mining, and it makes a lot of sense because silver is only a small part of their revenues now, since they have such productive gold mines. In this week's news, we have the Fortuna Annual Meeting, in which they changed their name from Fortuna Silver Mines to Fortuna Mining with a new logo, which oddly enough looks sort of like the Pittsburgh Steelers logo with that blue star instead of the black one and the yellow one or whatever the colors are exactly, remember? Steelers, silverers, it's pretty similar. It might have to do with something with digging metal out of the ground or making metal, something like that. And for all those who wanted to know Jorge Ganoza's full name, it's actually Jorge Ganoza Durant. Did you know that? I didn't know that. Well, now the secret is out. In other news, Fortuna intersects 23.7 grams per ton of gold over 17.8 meters from the Kingfisher Prospect at the Segala Mine. For those who want to know what a Kingfisher is, a Kingfisher is this bird. This is a, a female Kingfisher, and this is a male Kingfisher. He looks like somebody you'd like to hang out with if you were a bird. I would like to hang out with this guy. He looks pretty cool. But back to the intersection, you have 23.7 grams per ton over an estimated true width of 17.9 meters. Other highlights are down here. We have 209 grams per ton of gold over an estimated true width of 0.7 meters from 335 meters. Another one of nearly 50 over here at SGRD 1895 in the Ancien deposit. Another one of 38.3 grams per ton of body or prospect over an estimated true width of 3.5 meters from 27 meters. This looks like a very fertile and productive project that is getting bigger with new discoveries. And with that, we will continue with this week's Silver Report brought to you by FSM, which is now Fortuna Mining. We have the yen breaking up, which means breaking down because the higher this number, the weaker the yen is. This shows 158.26, but this is from yesterday. We are at 159 now, the all-time high being up here where that candle is at about 160 something, 160 point something. Uh, we could break that at any time, which would spur more intervention by the Japanese central bank 
the Bank of Japan. And speaking of uh, intervention from the Bank of Japan, here is an article that makes a lot of sense. This is from Reuters, published today, June 21st, 2024. U.S. finds no currency manipulation in 2023. None. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Japan added to the monitoring. Oh, they're being monitored. So we're, they're going to monitor Japan for currency manipulation. Well, the entire monetary system is currency manipulation. Let's go to the even funnier paragraph halfway down the article. Japan's intervention. Subtitle. The official said... The one, I guess, deciding who's manipulating and who's not manipulating. Japan's recent foreign exchange interventions to prop up the value of the yen were not a factor, not a factor in deciding to add the country to the currency monitoring list. Well, you see, when they actually manipulate their currency, that's not a factor in adding them to the currency manipulation monitoring list. That 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 makes a lot of sense. Absolutely nothing. Stupid. You're so stupid. When you read these articles, you really got to read them for a comedy because uh, that's what they are. It's become a comedy outlet. Because if you take it as anything other than that, you'll just cry. <laughs> I'm sorry, can we cut? Point being that the country with the biggest exposure to the U.S. bond market, to the treasury market, is Japan and their currency is crashing. And what are they going to do when their currency crashes? They will have to sell treasuries in order to buy U.S. dollars, in order to sell U.S. dollars to buy yen to strengthen their currency, which they've done. Uh, but it hasn't really done much other than keep the yen strong for another few weeks. But the market is a lot stronger than the Bank of Japan. I wanted to give some perspective here as to the problem with the yen that it is mostly bonds. And why is that? Well, this graph here from Bloomberg shows that the Bank of Japan holds over 50% of the outstanding bonds, Japanese government bonds. So meaning the yen is the bond market. And if Japanese interest rates go higher then the yen weakens because the yen is the bond market. And now to compare to the Federal Reserve we have in the title, I calculated if you calculate the amount of treasuries on the Fed's balance sheet versus the uh, outstanding debt of the United States, you get the Fed owns 12.8% of the outstanding treasury bonds, and the Bank of Japan owns 54. So that's like four times what the Fed owns of its own bond market, meaning the yen is much more sensitive to Japanese government bond interest rates than the Fed, and the dollar, I mean, is sensitive to uh, dollar interest rates. Now, there is something going on with the dollar in a technical sense. Uh, these patterns are more of an art than a science, but I did notice this that whenever the dollar gets into a consolidated triangle, uh, a crisis uh, usually happens when that triangle is resolved. So we have uh, three examples of this, one nested within another one, and then the third one that is happening now. So we have, if we look first at this black one, this is a long, long triangle from the top of the US dollar index in 2001, it looks like. Uh, and the triangle was hit uh, in 2017, and uh, it resolved itself right before the COVID crisis, uh, the lockdown crisis over here in 2020, and then we had a huge financial crisis over here. Within that large triangle, we had nested within it a smaller one uh, from the from 2010. 2014, 2010 was the end of 2008 financial crisis when the dollar uh, sprung higher and then hit a low when gold and silver hit another high year in 2011. This is around when silver hit $50, if you remember, and I'm sure you do. Uh, and then we had another triangle closing in at the end of 2014. And then all of a sudden, when this was finally resolved, we had an oil crisis. Uh, the price of oil fell to, I think, around $26 ultimately in 2016. And OPEC was in trouble. It was a whole thing that started in December 2014 when this triangle was resolved. Uh, now we have a third triangle that is forming and almost at a resolution here. Uh, from 2021, the the, the all-time low in interest rates and the peak of the COVID printing insanity uh, to here, which uh, was the dollar high in 2022. And we are in a very steep triangle that appears to uh, be on the verge of resolution over here at about 105.2, exactly where we are right now. I didn't check, but somewhere around there. Uh, this could manifest itself in many different ways in a, in a reverse repo crisis, in a repo crisis, in a repocalypse, something. 
uh, like that. It doesn't matter exactly what the nature of the crisis is going to be, but if this uh, may, remains true to form, it might be, then uh, we're pretty close to something big. This is just a close-up of that same triangle from 2021 to now. You can see here that uh, we're sandwiched between about 103.5 and 105.17, uh, and we're very close to this resolving one way or another. I personally think it will go up as we head into a final dollar crisis uh, when liquidity looks for dollars uh, because we need to serve as debt and everyone is suffering from high interest rates right now. So we have one liquidity crunch still ahead of us and it's not going to take long. And from then we're going to start the final printing round, as I've been saying since I began the Endgame Investor. Now, if you want a little bit of fun, I'm not sure how valid this is, but I saw it and I just wanted to put it in just for kicks here. So we have a uh, massive zoom out for Fruity Circus Chartist Triangle Enthusiasts. Uh, that would be a good band name. I thought it sounded pretty nice, so I just put that in there. Uh, we have a triangle, maybe, from the top of the dollar in 1985. At, I think it was like 165 or something like that. Maybe I'm off by 10. Uh, it was some crazy amount when the dollar was strengthening off the back of Volcker's hikes from 1980. It looks like we've tagged that triangle here in 2022 at that top and uh if you want to count this as a triangle, it looks like this humongous thing is going to be resolved pretty soon. And that's going to be pretty big. Now this, if you're asking me what I'm looking at these days to try to triangulate in time the next financial crisis, I'd have to say it's this chart. And uh, to explain this, this is the proportion of re bank reserves that are taken up by repos by overnight repos. Overnight repos is the, the bank lending between banks that I mentioned a lot. And that is a the, the key to the basement or the dungeons or the sewers of the monetary system. Uh, so the repocalypse happened in September, 2019, when repos took up about 85% of the outstanding bank reserves available. Uh, now today's number that just came out yesterday, actually, is 2.021 trillion, that's the amount of overnight repos now, per night, for, as of last night, over, divided by 3.366 trillion, that's the amount of bank reserves available. So the amount of repos taking up, uh, the amount of reserves taken up by repos, excuse me, is about 60%, up from 57% last week, that's a big jump. Uh, once we get to 85%, well, we should be in crisis territory. It doesn't mean it has to go that high. Uh, but reserves are falling, repo volume is rising. So we could be here within the next, uh, I don't know, two, three months, maybe a little longer, maybe shorter, but this is definitely where we're headed and uh, we're not gonna reverse until the Fed prints again. I wanna show you where that chart comes from. So on the top, we have secured overnight financing volume. That's the repo volume. How many dollars are switching hands between banks every night? The re last apocalypse happened around here when it was 1.2, Two trillion a night. Uh, why did it happen there? Because uh, the um, the amount of reserves available at that time, at the same date here, is one point three eight trillion. So one point two trillion over one point three eight trillion. That's about eighty seven percent. That's where it comes from. So here we are. Here now we have two point oh two one trillion a night. You can see that the volume has been rising up steadily since around July twenty twenty two, um, on a pretty consistent slope. Uh, and uh, reserves now are three point three six six trillion. The regional banking crisis happened around here with three trillion. Uh, we're at three point three six six trillion. Uh, I just wanted to go into a quick chart of Bitcoin versus gold. Uh, how is Bitcoin doing relative to gold? Well, uh, a lot of the Bitcoiners believe that there has been a new high as of 2024. Not quite. Not really. There's been a lower high in 2024 at about 34 ounces of gold per Bitcoin. But uh, we're in a triangle consolidation here as well. And uh, the actual high happened in October of 2021. And we haven't gotten close to that. We got, I could say, I guess we got close to it here, but uh, we're headed down to the series of lower highs now. Uh, I called the Bitcoin top uh, over around here uh, this year earlier. And um, a lot of people made fun of me. Maybe I'm wrong, could be wrong. We'll see if I'm right. I call it in gold terms, of course. I don't really care about dollar terms that much. And so the mood in the silver market is sort of like the mood here in northern Israel. We don't know when we're going to war. Uh, there's still periodic bombings, though there hasn't been much here this week, thank God. In the meantime, reserves are shrinking, repos are increasing, 
there's going to be a collision between the two markets exactly when we don't know, but we see the numbers going in the wrong directions or the right directions, if that's what you want. And in the meantime, Norin Chicken Bank is announcing that it's selling $65 billion in bonds in an attempt, I believe, to get the Fed to buy them. Once they do, we all know what's going to happen to silver. This is Rafi with the Endgame Investor. If you enjoyed this week's Silver Report, then sign up for the Endgame Investor on Substack and also check out my Patreon, where this week we are going into a list of racist jokes about money by Romans. I'll see you guys next week.